when you're in a new spot and something doesn't work, it feels like all eyes are on you. But I want you guys to know that his mic was the mic used in the gym, and it's not the tech team. It's not Kyle's fault. I forgot to tell him he had to switch mics. So that's on me. And number two, uh, Darla Teague is here this morning, um, and I just wanted to thank her about the whole house thing. We bought a lot on her other side of her a couple of, several years ago and put that new parking lot area in. So we're surrounding the Teague house, and we mentioned to her way back when that if you're ever interested in selling, we just don't want it to turn into a dispensary. You know, I want someone over there selling weed. So we, and there's a ministry use. Um, so, but you know, you can, as a church, you can have a really bad neighbor. She's been wonderful. And when, when she, she lost her husband years ago and then lost her father just a couple of months ago, and she, she wanted to move into her father's condo. So she came to us just like we'd said, look, if you're ever going to get rid of it, just if you'd let us know. Um, we, we might be interested. And we reached out to, when it came available, we re- reached out to some donors to ask if they thought it was a good idea, and if so, could they help? Um, if you want to help, we'd love some help with it, but um, we had the money, and it, it's blessing the Teagues, and it's blessing us and future ministry use. So I just want to, Darla, you handled yourself with grace all the way through this thing. I just, just thank you uh, for hearing us before with all the stuff that the construction that went around your house a couple of years ago. Um, you were just very gracious. And I know there's a lot of emotion tied in with the house and all of that, but just thank you for that. Um, one other thing before I start talking about Hebrews, and uh, I, I got on Friday, I got my man card officially. Um, never done this. Didn't have a, my, my dad didn't know how to change a bike tire. So I needed rear brakes, and my son-in-law and I put rear brakes on my vehicle, and um, it should have taken about an hour and 15 minutes, brakes and rotors, should have taken about an hour and 15 minutes, took us five. I wouldn't, it would still be up on jacks in my garage if my son-in-law weren't there, and I don't think I'll do it again. So um, we're in Hebrews chapter 6, but just like in chapter 4, you had to go back to 3, and in chapter 5, you had to go back to 4, and in chapter... Was six, I have to go back to five, um, just to set the tone, because there's a strange change of voice with the author of Hebrews in, uh, in chapter five, and it sets up chapter six. So I'm going to go back in just a moment and read just a few verses. They won't be on your, it won't be on your screen, but a few verses of five to set up six. Uh, and I want to tell you a couple things about this passage. This is, I know that sometimes you're like, I don't need all the context. You just got to know something about this passage. It is one of the most hotly debated passages in all of the New Testament amongst New Testament scholars. Um, People use it. It's not a bludgeon uh, passage, but people use it to see we got it right. No, we got it right. And it's because of uh, of the theology you come to this passage with. So I'm going to just give you a a little um, heads up on it. And if when I read this, this sticky passage, this tough warning, um, if you hear my take on it and you're like, ah, I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay. Okay. We will get to heaven one day and we'll find out how wrong we both were. I'm sure. Um, but it, it's, it's sticky and there's other sticky passages in the scripture. So here, there's a guy named John Calvin. Um, he was a reformer in Geneva. Um, so after Martin Luther left the Catholic church and this whole Protestant or Protestant, uh, version of Christianity started taking hold, um, Calvin was, uh, Most Reformed and Presbyterian churches have a Calvinistic view of covenant theology. Lots of words I know. I'm going to explain it. He had a group of people that were scared to death to do anything Christian-wise. They they were afraid that they would lose their salvation. So they lost the priesthood because the priesthood was Catholic. And in in, in, in Catholicism, if you sin, a priest sits before you, you confess it, they forgive you on behalf of Christ. They give you some penance or some Hail Marys and Our Fathers to do. uh, And then you know, I'm good. But what if you don't have that assurance? Um, So they were afraid to do anything because they were worried that they might do something good with the wrong motives or do something with the right motives and do something bad. They're afraid of sin and that they might die in their sin. And Calvin's like, I'm your pastor. You are good. You are, you, I'm, I'm going to stay over here because that's the Armenia side. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, you're, you're assured of your salvation. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You, God chose you. He has adopted you as children. You are the elect. Don't worry about it. Now get out there and be bold. Okay. Another guy who was a pastor, and he had um, a congregation. His name was Arminius, and they, they shared a few years in there. Um, but Arminius' people were like, because of the grace of God, I can do anything I want. 
I can sin all the more, so grace will abound. God has to forgive me. He forgave me. We have a high priest on the throne of God forever. So he has forgiven me. He is forgiven me, and he will always forgive me. So we can do whatever he wants. And he's like, no, you got to be careful. You might lose it. You might lose your salvation. And so if Calvin had had Arminius' congregation, Calvin likely would have said similar things to Arminius. And Arminius, if he had Calvin's congregation, he would have likely said similar things to similar things as Calvin. But what their followers have done is moved them further and further and further away. So this is one of those passages that five theologians can meet each other and there'll be five different takes on this passage. Can you lose your salvation or are you once saved, always saved? That's where we're headed. That's the tricky, sticky passage, but this actually ends up being a great encouragement. And I hope that you leave here today having been encouraged, remaining encouraged, and remembering to take courage because God sits on the throne. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for who you are. And thank you for even the sticky passages. They remind us of just how we look through the glass dimly, that we don't see it all, that you are all, you know everything. And what you've revealed to us, you've revealed to us to comfort us, to encourage us, to chastise us sometimes, but mostly to show us who you are so we can live accordingly. So we bless you for that. So we only want to hear what you want to say. We only want to see what you want to show. We only want to receive what you want to give. So help this message be your message for us, not my message for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the last few verses of chapter 5 read like this. We have much to say about this. He's talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek, or of Jesus in the order of Melchizedek. We'll get back to that next week because that's all of chapter 7. Um, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. That right there tells you where he's headed. This is a strange segment when he's like, you're a bunch of babies. You might not even be saved, but I have faith in you. Let's go. So think about a basketball game or a football game and the coach and you're, you're, that you're supposed to beat this team, you were counting on beating this team, and you're just, you, can't, you can't put one on the basket, you can't pass well, or you keep going off sides and the coach is like, I can't even believe, you've never, what in the world, you're the worst team I've ever had. But get out there and do it. That's kind of what he's doing. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on uh, about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from the acts that lead to death of the f of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, laying out of hands and resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And God permitting, therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. God permitting, we will do so. It's a strong con confusing sentence. Here's the sticky one. It is impossible for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss, they are crucifying the son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it, and that, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives a blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless as an in as it, and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Well, that, that's, that's encouraging. So can you backslide so far that you end up losing your salvation? Is there perseverance of the saints or not? This is the big debate between the Wesleyans and many of the Baptists and the Reformers. And it's a legitimate debate. And to be perfectly frank, I don't even think Paul knew. I'm going to quote him from Philippians 2. 
Listen to this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So whose responsibility is it? Is it God or is it me? Work out your own salvation or it's God willing and acting in you according to his good purpose? The true theological doctrinal answer to that is yes. Who's responsible for your salvation? Did you say God? Amen. Amen right answer. Everything necessary for your salvation has already been done. It's been offered. It's been set forward. It's the person of Jesus, his death, resurrection, and ascension to the Father. It's all done. It's buttoned up. It's ready to go. It, it, it's there. It's completely done by God. We've done nothing to deserve it. It is unmerited favor. It is grace and mercy, period. But it must be received. Who's responsible for your sanctification? What, that Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. The process by which he refuses to leave you that way, we call sanctification. Who's responsible for your sanctification? God. And me. I'm supposed to participate and cooperate with the work he's trying to do. So I don't have an answer specifically for this, but there is one thing that we, that when we, when we read that passage, and I know you're not having all these theological debates, but there's one thing that when we read this passage, we, we kind of go right by and it kind of, and I think we're so far removed from the crucifixion that we forget some of the shame that went with it for Jesus's followers. Because it says, if someone does this, they are crucifying the son of God all over again by subjecting him to public disgrace. So, Remember the cross. Jesus' followers were, a few of them showed up at the foot of the cross. Some of the women, some of the men might have been way out in the back. But remember what was happening as the Son of God is hanging on a cross dying. You healed others, or you saved others, save yourself. Call down angels from heaven. So they're mocking him, they're ridiculing, they're cajoling him, they're doing whatever they can. And if you're a follower of Jesus after that, and you think about what humiliation he actually endured, someone who could, who could be in the, in the crowd on Sunday, Palm Sunday, five days before he's crucified, saying, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and then be at the trial of Jesus and say, and, and yelling, crucify him, crucify him, and then standing at the foot of the cross as a spectacle, mocking someone who's being killed for no apparent reason. The author here is saying, if you're that, if you're that far gone, if you're that hard of heart, you're not coming back. Jesus, when he talks about the unforgivable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, remember the context that showed up. The Pharisees are accusing him of, of operating under the authority of the devil when he's doing miracles that come from God. So if you're so far gone, you're so hardened of heart, this is what the author here is saying, you're so hardened of heart that you see something of God and you call it of the devil, or vice versa, you see something of the devil and you call it holy, you're lost. How's that sitting? It's a hard passage, and I don't like it at all. But then it gets encouraging. So let's just say I stood up here and said, you're all going to hell. But friends, that's what he does. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make our hope sure, or to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Then he gives an example. When God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. 
And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument, because God wanted to make it to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, the oath and the promise, the two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We have fled, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the, for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, that's the Holy of Holies, where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We'll get more to the order of Melchizedek later. But you see how he shifts from, folks, you might be so far gone that you can't come back to, that is the reason to be diligent. Don't be lazy. Don't, 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 don't be like a wave on Lake Michigan when, when, when there's a water spout coming. With just tossed around all over the place. Whichever way culture goes, whichever way this goes, whatever everyone thinks is right, everyone's doing what they think is right in their own eyes, and you do it along with them. Don't do that. He's saying that we're, you can be confident of better things. That God, if God, may, he, God swore by himself that all will be blessed. Every people group. It, that, that covenant was confirmed over and over and over. With each patriarch, there was a covenantal uh, restoration or, or, or recommitment from God. He made it with Abraham. He made it with Isaac. He made it with Jacob. He made it with Joe. He just kept on going. And he fulfilled it in the person of Christ. We were told God, God swore by himself that one of Abraham's descendants would be king over all, a reign that would not finish. He, and, and, and David was part of that line. Jesus was part of that line. And you know what, folks? You and I, we're part of that line. We may not have Hebraic blood, but through the, through the promise of the Holy Spirit and the receiving, the, the appearance of the Holy Spirit, and at Pentecost, God changed who his chosen people were. It's no longer just this, the, the, the descendants of Abraham through the Holy Spirit. We've been adopted. We are children of God. We are heirs to the throne. We will one day judge the angels and then rule with Christ and the, with heaven and earth where they meet, where they come together. That's, what, that's the picture of Eden, the garden, when, that, where God is work, walking and talking along with humans. It's the place where heaven and earth connect. That's what they were trying to do in the Tower of Babel. They were trying to build up so that they could get to where God is. And God's like, no, that's not how it works. I'm going to be, one day I'm going to come and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and all of us will live with God and with each other on this planet where heaven and earth connect and we will rule. Has that happened yet? You guys see Jesus sitting on an earthly throne? You see all injustice gone? You see the lion laying down with the lamb? You see all tears wiped away? No. You know what's beautiful about that? That tells us God's not done. He's not done with you. He's not done with us. He's not done with this planet. He's not done with Australia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea. He's not done with Asia, the subcontinent of India, Europe. He's not done with Russia and Ukraine and all of that. He's not done with South America, Central America, the Hispania, uh, or, or Mexico. He's not, he's not done with Antarctica. He's not done with Iceland or Greenland. He's not done. You know why I know that? If he were done, we'd see him on a throne that we can see with our own eyes. And because he's not done means that he wants us, he's got more he wants to do, not just in you, not just for you, through you. That's what he's telling. He, don't, don't just sit around and wait for someone else to tell you everything. My brother-in-law was a pastor, and, uh, and he had people. It was a new church plant. They just got huge. I mean, most of the New England patriots, were worship, the Christians, were worshiping there. Just became this huge evangelical church in suburban Boston. And someone, some woman came up to him one time, and, and it just happened to be a woman. I'm not saying some woman. That's not what I'm getting at. Um, walked up and goes, you know, when I come to church, I just want to get fed. With a Boston accent, but I can't do that when I can do a southern accent. And he goes, you know what? I don't think I could ever get away with it, but if I say he said it, then I'm all good. If you know you're old enough to be fed, you're old enough to feed yourself. How you doing? Are you feeding? Are you eating? Are you consuming the word of God? Or are you distracted? See, I look at the stuff going on in our world, and sometimes I'm like, come Lord Jesus, 
But that's not usually my, uh, that's my Christian way of saying it, but usually inside it's like, they're going to get what's theirs. They're going to get their comeuppance. They, they will one day realize that they're not God, and, and I know the one who is. I will be in paradise, and they will be doomed. So there's a little vengeance in there. And then other times I look at it, and I'm like, am I going to have to go to jail because I'm a Christian? Two quick stories. One, I was coming home from Denver on a plane, and there's a guy, and I'm sure I've told this story before. There's a guy sit, sitting next to me. I got a middle seat that time, um, which I love. Uh, and, and it's really awkward for pastors when you're on a plane and people want to talk because they don't want you to talk to them about what you do, but they don't know what you do. And, and, and Lynn is really bold. She's just out there. But this guy, for half an hour, tore into everything I hold dear. About, he talked about scriptures, he talked about the church, he talked about culture, he talked about one political party over the other. And I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to be polite because, you know, West Michigan, if you're from here, you, you, you just kind of swallow hard and don't want to make waves. So I'm just hearing it and, and I, I'm trying not to be offended, but deep down I'm like, oh. And then he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing all the time. What do you do? And my buddy had just given me a way to respond. And I used to say I'm a sheepdog. And then people, what, what? And then, well, yeah, I, I run around, I bark, I make a lot of noise, I try to keep the sheep following after the shepherd. And then if they want to know further, they're asking for it. But this one was, well, let me just put it to you this way. In some, many places in the world, what I do is illegal. And someday, maybe in the near future, what I do is going to be illegal here, too. And if he wants to follow up from there, now he thinks I'm a spy. But if he wants to follow up from there, then let's have the conversation. But I'm giving him an out. I have a friend. This is, a, this is not, in, this is not a relevant to the passage, but it's just flipping funny. I have a friend, Marty Smith, certified genius, Catholic. But he says I'm a Catholic, but I'm not a Shiite Catholic. It makes no sense, but it's hilarious. He, he fl flies on Southwest a lot where you just you know, you, 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 you line up and you just go find your seat. Well, he flies enough that he gets one of those first 20 places. So he, he gets in early. He always finds uh, 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 an aisle seat and he takes out of his briefcase a big wooden crucifix and he has a great big fat Catholic Bible, gold embossed. And so as people come down the aisle, he looks at him as like, <laughs> almost always gets a, a seat next to him all by itself. I just think that's genius. Um, so I don't know if that's the way to use the name of the Lord or the, or the, or the, or the crucifixion of the Lord, but nevertheless. Um, so I don't know what's coming. I don't, and you don't either. In fact, there's very little we have control over in our lives, honestly. We have control over the decision we make right now. The consequences we don't even have control over. There's wise decisions and there's unwise decisions, but we don't really know how it's going to play out. But we know the one who does. And we know that he's not done. And it might get really, really ugly. But are you going to be a friend, a fan, or a follower? It's an author of a book back in 2006, I believe. I was on my way down for sabbatical, and a buddy of mine who lives in Louisville went to this church, gave me CDs of that sermon series, and I listened to them on my way down uh, to Georgia. And um, he explains it this way that, and you see it, especially in the book of Matthew, but you see it elsewhere in the gospels where Jesus, all kinds of people are following. I mean, people are hanging on his everywhere. They're coming from all over. There's thousands of people coming. And then he breaks some bread and some fish and the, everybody eats. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's the new thing. It's the thing that everyone's excited about. It's the thing that gets everyone's heart going a little bit. They get the Holy Spirit shivers, everything. Yeah. And then Jesus tells them what's going to happen to them. If, they, if, if you're really going to be one of my disciples, there's a cost. In this, they will persecute you because of me. He warns them. He tells them what's going to happen if they are followers of Jesus. And he loses a bunch of those followers because they weren't followers. They were friends. And you have friends um, that, that you're buddies. You hang out. You're, you know, whatever. You have a laugh now and then. You, you, maybe you have something in common. And, but man, if, let's just say someone finds out something you put online 10 years ago and it doesn't fit the morality of today and the whole world decides to cancel you, those friends will be the first ones to leave. The author of Hebrews is saying, don't be that with Jesus. And then there's the fans. And I'm going to use one in particular. A Detroit Lions fan? Detroit Lions fan? Detroit Lions fan? Okay, Caden. Um, dangerous territory. 
You watch the game, preparing for disappointment, and you're saying, oh, we might win this one. We might win this one. And then when they, when they blow it, it's like they, 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 right? You notice the pronoun change. But if, if you're a real fan, a fanatic, it, 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 it affects your mood, your day, who you, who you are that day, but you're not actually participating. Even if you're wearing the underwear you wore last time that they, they won and your lucky socks and your jersey with the right name on the back, even if you're doing all that stuff, you really have no impact on the game. You're a spectator who's concerned about the outcome, but you're not a player. That's a fan. The author of Hebrews is worried that some of the Christians in that church are fans. A follower says, I will die if I must. And every one of the disciples was either beaten, imprisoned, only one of them wasn't martyred. He died in prison. One of them was boiled in oil. And you know how they would have avoided it? I made the whole thing up. Renounce Christ as Lord. And none of them, but none of them was willing to do that. They were so sold out. They believed so wholeheartedly that it was true. They saw it with their own eyes that they were willing to suffer flames or boiling oil or upside down crucifixion to make sure that they're faithful to the one who saved them and gave them eternity. Because they knew God wasn't done. And folks, you know God's not done. You know it, even if you're saying, well, maybe he is, maybe he's not really there. You know here. If you've got the Holy Spirit of God living in you, you know he's not done. And sometimes we get a little scared. And I get it, I don't know. I might be arrested one day because I do this. I can't be canceled because I'm not online. But who am I beholden to? Who are you beholden to? Are you fruitful? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, I still missed one. No, I got them? Yeah. In the right order? No, never in the right order. Lynn's not here to whisper them to me. You will know, be assured of your salvation by cooperating with God and seeing what he does. And most of us are pretty good at thanking God and being grateful for what he's done for us and for what he's done in us. But where we get, according to this, the wording of this passage, where we get a little lazy and not diligent is what God wants to do through us. Patience, perseverance, and faithfulness. Because God's not done. And he wants to do something with you for you, and through you. So I'm going to just ask you to ask yourself a couple of questions tonight. When the toothpaste hits the toothbrush or your head hits the pillow, before you, if you're like Lynn and you can fall asleep with two breaths, I, 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 I covet that ability, but I don't have it. So do it before, you, before, you, before your head hits the pillow if you're one of those people. Lord, where in my life would you want me to be more fruitful? And then second, Lord, what do you want to do through me? Where would you have me be more, be more fruitful? It's basically the same question, two different sides. You can be thankful for what he's done in and for, but what might he want to do through? Because there are people all around you that are going to hell and they have no idea. And I've asked you this question before. That's the que those are the questions for, for you tonight, but I've asked you the question before. I'm going to just pose it out there again. These are not accusations. These are encouragements. If Christianity were illegal, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you of the crime of being a Christian? If so, praise God. And keep moving. If no, 
It might be time to ask God where he wants to have you be more fruitful. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. And give us courage. Courage to be faithful, even when it's hard. Courage to be thankful, even in difficulty. And courage to be hopeful when it seems like all hope is lost. As the author of Hebrews tells us, Lord, let us, give us the ability to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, knowing that the one who promised is faithful.